Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Indizor Education. Um, today I would like to talk about um, a few different applications of uh, um, uh, integral uh, of integrals, uh, primarily of some kind of a physical um, kind applications, which is not a surprise actually, because the whole concept of integrals was developed by people who were quite familiar with physics, like Newton and Leibniz. Uh, well, actually, they have created uh, the physics as we basically know it and, and learn in school. So, um, it was created from real practical needs. Um, now, the previous lecture was dedicated to um, area under curve, which seems to be a little bit more mathematical than practical. Today I will talk about certain practical problems which lead to the concept of uh, definitive integral. Well, this uh, lecture is part of the course of advanced mathematics for teenagers uh, presented on unisor.com. Um, I suggest you to go to this website actually to listen to this lecture because the site has not only the references to video lectures but also very detailed notes for each lecture and exams for those people who uh, are willing to take exams not for every lecture but for many of them okay so we will talk about uh, three different uh, problems and in all three of them we will show how the same concepts which we were talking about um, when dealing with the area under curve actually are applicable to these cases. Okay, the first problem is how to calculate the distance covered by let's say a car. Okay, so if the car drives with a constant speed from the moment time is equal to a to time is equal to b and we know that speed let's say the speed is v whatever it is meters per second and these are times in seconds obviously we know how to calculate the distance covered we just multiply the speed by the period of time during which this car was moving so that's easy what if our speed is not constant but instead a function of time and let's say we do know this function of time and again our problem is exactly the same we have to calculate how much we have covered from the moment of time t equals to a to moment of time t equals to b if at any no if at uh, any particular moment we know the speed of of the car and obviously we assume that this speed is smooth so we don't really have uh, you know during certain period of time the speed is one and then in the immediately next moment of time the speed grows to something somewhere so it's smooth function continuous differentiable whatever you want whatever we need actually Okay, so how can we approach this problem? Well, it's not easy, and again, Newton, uh, Sir Isaac Newton and uh, Leibniz as well, were basically facing the same problem. And what they have decided to do is very similar to what we were talking about when presenting the area under curve. Let's, in this particular case, divide our interval into a smaller parts from A to B we have divided into small um, intervals of time now since our function is relatively smooth if the interval between, let's say, ti and ti minus 1 
if from t minus 1 to ti, if this interval is relatively small, then the speed on the left um, margin of this interval, or on right marginal, or the maximum speed during this time, or a minimum speed of during this time, they are very, very close. So, let's assume that to approximate the time, uh, the, um, the distance we have covered from time t minus, uh, uh, ti minus 1 to ti, uh, which we will actually call delta ti. So, during this particular uh, interval of time, we assume that since the speed is not really uh, changing very much, considering this interval is small, we can say that, okay, approximately the speed during this period of time is this. Since we know the function v at any moment of time, we know it at this particular moment of time, which is the right margin of this particular interval, right? Well, we can as well take the left um, boundary of the interval and take the speed and consider it to be constant. So, considering this is a constant speed during this interval, we will have certain approximation to um, the real distance covered during this particular time, right? So, let's call it delta Si, which is uh, speed at moment ti multiplied by the length of the time. So, this is not exact distance we have, which we have covered during this interval of time. But as an approximation, it's good enough. Now, the approximation, it's intuitively obvious, will be better if this interval is narrower. So, the speed will not change too much, right? So, let's consider that um, as we summarize these distances uh, by i, and we will take the limit of this as number of intervals goes to infinity and the maximum of delta x goes to zero. So, even the widest time interval still shrinks to zero. So, considering this is our process, it's reasonably to assume that this particular sum, which constitutes an approximation of the um, distances covered at each particular um, interval of time and summarized together, will be a good approximation and at the limit it will be the uh, exact distance which will be covered by this particular car. So, we cannot really escape but just defining the distance which is covered by the car uh, which moves with a variable speed through some process like this. And again, it's very much similar to um, our approach when we were calculating the area under the curve. What is area under the curve? The definition actually we have come up with is, okay, let's divide it into different pieces and let's increase the number of these intervals while the width of the um, widest uh, interval uh, converges to zero and summarize these pieces and that would be the area. So in this case we will do exactly the same thing. Except this is a very physical uh, part and we can actually measure okay our car at time t is equal uh, to a is at one particular point and then let's say we move along the straight line with a variable speed and at a moment t is equal to b we are at some other point and we actually measure the distance and this distance should be exactly the same as this one so basically it's a combination of something which we define and something which we can verify but in any case you should understand that this is a reasonable approach if we do not have a, a ruler um, which helps us to to measure the distance 
from the beginning to the end, but we only have the speed at each, at each moment of time, then we use this approach. Since we cannot measure physically the distance, we, we, have, we have only the speed, then we have to really do something like this. All right. So, the formula which we have come up with is exactly similar to the formula which we were using at calculating of the um, area under curve. And it's important because other two problems which I'm going to present will also lead to the same kind of formula and that would actually show how important this particular expression actually is. Okay, so next problem. Next problem is about draining the tab. Okay, let's say this is your tab and this is your drain. Now, as soon as I open the drain, the water starts going down, right? Now, the speed, let's say liters per second, uh, of the water, of the flow of the water going down the drain is changing because if the water is high, the pressure is high and the speed would be probably greater. The water is um, lower, the pressure will be lower, so the speed of the water will be also lower. By the way, if your uh, opening is not here, but let's say here on the side, you will see that it will go with a definitely higher speed out of this, uh, and you can actually measure it, uh, out of this uh, opening, right? So in any case, we have something which we can call a speed of the flow of the water measured in, let's say, liters per second, right? And we do know this particular function, and it's a smooth function, and all we need to know is how much water would flow out from the tub from the moment A to B. How can we measure it? We will do exactly the same. I mean, it, it looks like it's a different problem, but we will use exactly the same approach. We will divide this particular period in different certain number of intervals. The smaller the better, obviously, right? Now, we assume that during the period from, uh, from Ti minus first to Ti, speed is more or less constant, or I mean, it does change, but not significantly. So as an approximation, we can use the speed, let's say, at the moment t y t i as the speed which uh, which the water uh, was flowing out during this relatively small period of time, and the amount of water would be this, right? Where delta t i is t i minus t i minus one, and this is speed at the moment Ti. Ti. What do we do next? Well, we summarize it. And that gives us a total amount of water which has been flown out, but not exactly. It's just an approximation. To go into exact amount of water, we obviously have to go to a limit of this sum as n goes to infinity 
and maximum of delta t i converges to zero. So we are dividing with a finer and finer intervals, smaller and smaller, shorter and shorter intervals of time. And, that, and, and, and that's why our approximation becomes better and better and better. As in the previous case with the distance, we can obviously measure what's my level of water at moment t is equal to a, what's my level of water at t equals to b, and calculate exactly the volume which has been flown out. And we do understand that it should actually be equal to this one. And again, this is exactly the same kind of expression which we are interested in if we don't know really how to measure this particular volume. Consider the following. What if you have not just a straight uh, tap, or something like very strange shape, then even if you have the level uh, at t equals to a and then level at of t equals to, to b, whatever here is, this volume, you can't really calculate it easily, right? So you still need some kind of a mechanism, but if you know the speed which you can actually measure, then you um, will be able to calculate this volume using this approach because you can't even measure it. By the way, in the previous problem, if it's a straight distance, that, that's fine. Um, you can actually measure where the car was in the beginning and at the end. If the, dis if the way the car moves is really very kind of uh, curvy, that's not so easy because you really have to know how to measure the curves, the length of the curves, which is a completely different story and we did not really talk about this yet. That's a difficult thing to do, to define it. But this approach will always give you the result. So you have to be able to calculate the same type of expression which we have obtained from this particular problem. And let me give you one more problem which gives exactly the same kind of a formula. That would be the final. How many different examples do you need to, to convince you that this is really a very important kind of a approach in formulas? Okay, we are talking about volume of solids of revolution. I'm not talking about revolution in a political sense. I'm talking about the following. Let's say you have some kind of a curve. And defined from A to B. And this is the curve which define a three-dimensional body obtained if we uh, revolve this uh, around the x-axis, right? So what will be if you will um, spin this particular thing around the x-axis? It will be certain three-dimensional uh, solid, right? And we need to uh, determine its volume. Let me give you a simple example. If you have a straight line as f at x, from A to B, and you are revolving this around the x-axis, what will you have? Well, you will have a cylinder, right? Now this would be the radius of this cylinder, and this would be the height of this cylinder, right? So the volume would be equal to pi r square h, right? Pi r square would be uh, the, the area of a circle which is the right base of this cylinder, the same as left base of this cylinder, and the, by, uh, well, instead of h, I actually should put b minus a, and instead of r, I should put function square of, let's say, of b, 
or LA doesn't really matter because they're the same. It's a straight line parallel to X, right? So that would be my volume. Now, if you have a slightly different case, again, relatively simple, a little bit more complex, if you have a straight line between A and B, what will be if you start revolving around the x-axis? Well, you will have a truncated cone, right? If it goes up to this, from this to this, and you uh, spin it around the x-axis, you will have a cone. But if it's from A to B, you will have a truncated cone, right? Without the top. That's what you will have. And again, we know how to calculate the volume of this particular case. What I'm talking about in this case, a more general case is, I have no idea what this function is, and I do know that it revolves, the whole uh, curve revolves around x-axis, and we need to know the volume. How can I calculate this? Well, there are no formulas, right? So, I will approach it in exactly the same way. So, from A to B, I divide it in different small intervals. Well, actually, I will use x instead of t. It's not a time, it's distance. So, xi minus 1 and xi. So, a is x0, then x1, x2, x3, and b is xn. Now, if I will consider only this piece from x uh, i minus 1 to x i to x i there will be a, a thin kind of a slice right something like this right now this is not a straight line this is this which is kind of a curvy right whenever it spins around so this is our x axis right so this is the piece I turned at 90 degrees and um, that would be the result. Now, this is not a cylinder, although it's very much close to a cylinder. The smaller my interval between xi minus 1 and xi is, the thinner is my slice. And that's why these little boundaries, I can just basically ignore them in approximation and say that the radius of this cylinder is, let's say, function of xi, right? This one. Because there is no big difference. Because this is f of xi, and on the bottom you have f of x i minus 1, right? But they are very close to each other, because we consider the function f of x is smooth enough. So the smaller height of this slide and height is what the distance between um, x uh, i minus 1 and x i right so the height of the cylinder is x i minus x i minus x i minus 1 which is delta x i and the radius of this cylinder is f at x i right so the volume of the cylinder is pi r square h, so it's pi f square of xi times delta xi. Now, the total volume of all these slices is approximately a sum of these. And if I would like to really know the volume of the uh, solid, uh, which is a result of a revolution of this particular um, uh, graph this curve, I have to take the limit. And the limit again is as number of slices, number of in, uh, intervals goes to infinity with the largest um, among them converges by lengths in, uh, to zero. So again, I have exactly the same formula. Some kind of a function at value times the 
uh, uh, interval of argument and then the limit so more and more important becomes this particular construction well in this particular case function is actually not f of x it's pi f square of x but doesn't matter what kind of a function it's a function so we have basically a very general very general construction which looks like this limit sum of function of x i delta x i i from 1 to n n goes to infinity and maximum of delta x i goes to zero so this is a construction which we are dealing again and again and again and this is exactly the one which we were dealing with area of curve uh, area under the curve right and in that lecture when i was talking about area under curve i was talking about two extremely important uh, considerations about this particular thing number one if function is relatively smooth its continuity, maybe differentiability, etc. I mean, that's something which I, I, I did not define like exactly, completely. I said it's sufficiently smooth to basically justify whatever the logic we were using. So for a smooth function, this particular limit exists regardless of the way how exactly I'm partitioning my um, segment from A to B into individual intervals so as long as number of intervals goes to infinity and the maximum width of the interval is converging to zero the limit would exist and it will be exactly the same so there is an existence and there is a, a uniqueness this is a number basically it's a certain number which is number one it exists number two it's unique regardless of the way how I divide my um, interval into pieces. And that's what will lead us to the next lecture, which will be a definition of the integral, defi the, uh, definite integral. Um, and basically it will be, I, I, will <laughs> I can tell you right now, okay, this limit is the definite integral. But that will be the next lecture, and I will basically talk about properties of this interval, integral, etc. Well, for now, that's it. Thank you very much. I, I do suggest you to read all the notes for this lecture on unizor.com. Um, and, uh, well, basically, I always encourage you to take the whole course from the beginning. But this is kind of at the end of this course already. All right, so that's it. Good luck. Thanks a lot. See you next time.